Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you recall, a little while ago, Paul Suntup released a book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by this little known guy named Roald Dahl. Maybe you heard of it, maybe you didn't, maybe it's your bag, maybe it wasn't, but the book looks brilliant, looks awesome. I uh, wrangled a copy myself and read it. It's a powerful book in such a slim tome. Really a great thing to read, whether you're a kid or a person who aged beyond childhood but still is a kid inside. And um, um, the guy who wrote the introduction in that book, by, by, he goes by the handle Donald Sturrock. I had the pleasure of sitting down to chat with him ahead of time, talk to him about this incredible life of Roald Dahl this incredible book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and what it's meant to the world. Sit back, pour yourself something tasty. Uh, maybe uh, sarsaparilla. Sioux City sarsaparilla. It's a good one. And enjoy this interview, this chat. Um, if anything else, it's just uh, amazing to look behind the curtain and see get an understanding of the people who create such culture shifting works. And I'd recommend this book. I don't read biographies, but wow, this is gripping. Um, a great read and highly recommend to anybody who's a fan of uh, brilliant imaginations. Cheers. For once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. It's intimidating to interview a professional interviewer, uh, somebody who you, I mean, we worked for the BBC. Uh, it's, it's amazing. You scored an interview with uh, Roald Dahl. If you've read my book, you probably know more about Roald Dahl than I do because uh, uh, you know, it, it was 10 years ago, and although I'm still very involved, you know, I, the, some of the details are a little hazy. Uh, so talk, talk about that. What was it like nah. being a young guy going after an interview with, with this, this amazing, iconic figure? Well, um, <clears throat> I would say that it was, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was really interesting as, as, as a young man to have that experience. I probably only realized how interesting it was years later, but uh, I was very ambitious, probably cocky little 22 year old, 23 year old. And I'd been asked to make a, a film for a book program, which I wanted to work for. And they'd given me the, you know, the, the crisp, a slot at Christmas to do a children's book. And so I thought, oh, children's book damn you know but then they said well have you any ideas about what you'd like to do and I sort of pretty much reached for the most famous name that I could think of that I knew was alive and accessible and uh, my boss said oh well, you'll be you, you know you'll never get him he's notoriously cantankerous and difficult and uh, ha ha you're you know you're just you've just made a, a kind of whip to beat yourself with that but I was undeterred by this, you know, as most uh, ambitious 22 year olds would be. And so I, I remember I looked, I looked his name up in the telephone directory um, with, when one had those things 40 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I called him up and he answered the phone. And uh, I said, hello, I'm Donald Sturrock from the BBC and I'd like to come and make a film about you and, uh, and interview you. And he said, oh, all right, come and have lunch, which I did. And I do remember rocking up to his house, which is this charming little cottage in the countryside, about 45 minutes drive from London. And uh, it had a very small door and this enormous man. <laughs> I hadn't quite realized how tall he was. He was six foot six, six foot seven. Um, and he occupied the whole doorway. And I remember him looking me up and down and saying, go and sit over there. And I just wait, wait for a bit. And then he disappeared. Um, and uh, I sat in this sitting room and suddenly realized I was looking at Francis Bacon paintings on the wall. <laughs> and I thought, I have never been anywhere. And it wasn't a grand house. It was just a small, small cottage anyway. Um, so that, I thought this guy is more interesting than I realized. And uh, anyway, he came back after about 10 or 15 minutes and we had lunch and 
everything went well and the, the actual whole filming process was 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 a breeze he was one of yeah. the easiest people that i i ever worked with um and then after he died i was at his memorial service and uh uh, his widow was, said, oh, I'm so glad you came and blah, 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 blah. And then she told me a story that in fact, when, <laughs> when, uh, uh, when he'd seen me in the doorway, he said, uh, um, and I don't know if I can, I'm allowed to swear on your, your show here. Uh, I, I, think I'll, I think I'll tone it down a bit. Okay, he'd, sure. <laughs> he'd looked me up and down and gone off and gone into her, and shut the door of, of her little office and said, oh my God, They've sent a beep, beep, beep child. To oh do my this. God. Um, oh, however, wow. uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes as he knew very well, a child was quite a good, quite a good choice because I done, I did my homework, and, uh, and and we got on very well. You know, we got on very well, and he was very plain talking and blunt, um, as you would probably expect. Um, but uh, you know, I, I I found it a very rewarding, rewarding experience. Isn't it the isn't it wonderful that armor of naivete that 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 impro you, you nothing's impossible nothing's even improbable and you can jump into it without you can walk right into the lion's den uh it I'm I'm envious of those days before you had yep. enough uh bad memories to remember oh that interview that thing went horribly you don't have enough of that everything's possible that's amazing. Um, no, I know exactly what you mean. And it's sort of that thing that you don't even know it is a line stand. Right. Into it, you know, um, hey, this is going to be, um, uh, you know, this is just another day, another job. Right. It's not a disaster. You've never had a disaser. And then you have a few. And then you realize, yeah. oh, I didn't like the way that felt. Um, <clears throat> that's that. So it almost never happened. He almost at that moment, just what was he going to do? Send you away? <laughs> I guess he might have done. I mean, fortunately, Lissy, his wife, uh, said, "Come on, you know, he's come all this way. Give it, you know, yeah. give it, give him a try." Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, yes, and I, I, you know, going through this book and um, <clears throat> and reading those things, what what really struck me is how honest you are about that. It's it's not just it's not hero worship. It is definitely. Uh, a portrait of a man and, and trying to understand. In fact, when you fact check him on his autobiography, uh, that's amazing because, it, but, but it's also a glimpse into the man himself, right? The fact that he would be loose with the facts of his autobiography. Um, what, what did that say about him to you that he would kind of just get the facts of his own life wrong and be fine with it? Well, he did once say to me that he thought nearly every biography was boring. Um, and yeah. he said that quite strongly. Um, uh, so I, I guess he felt that, and that's why I called my book Storyteller, because I think he really liked telling stories. And he thought, like most storytellers, if you embellish a detail here or there, you know, it even improve the story. That's more interesting than the listener, than, to the listener, than somebody right. who just gives you the absolute accurate facts and 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 after all I, I mean I know this now in a way that I didn't know when I was younger but you know the one I think almost everyone when you tell stories from one's own past after a certain age particularly if they're sort of 30 or 40 years old you 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 don't really you seldom really remember them in the raw you kind right. of remember the story and then you change a little detail here and there to to suit your audience yeah, you know, it's 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 like the facts are less important than the experience, you know, uh, yeah. that that this is how it felt. And this was the magic of the moment. And I'm trying to deliver that to you instead of like, oh, exactly who was there or, you know, or, or what was said. But it, I mean, so th that's one thing I was struck and I'm, I'm going to devour the rest of this um, because to be honest, this is my first experience with Roald Dahl, like uh, except for the movie. Right. Um, the Gene Wilder movie, not uh, that Johnny Depp thing, but yeah. uh, the, the Gene Wilder movie. Um, and, and so this, with this release was the first time I've ever read it. So um, knowing Suntup was releasing this edition, I went out and I got a very $3 and 50 cent copy with uh, the Quentin Blake illustrations and um, devoured it in a day or whatever. 
And um, it did bring me right back to the movie. So, uh, but one thing I, I'd like to put to you is somebody who's known the man, who's, who's, who's spent time, who's still very involved with the family. Um, why do you think this story touched everybody so universally? What is it about this tale? And, and I know there are some key differences between the movie and the book. They weren't deal breakers for me by any means, but what, what, what about it is so universal? Difficult question. I guess if I could confidently give you the answer, I might have a go at writing something like that myself. Sure. Um, sure. I, th I think, I, I mean, there are lots of things. I think chocolate is a pretty universal <laughs> love of kids and that sure. relishing of food. Um, you know, I, I think not very many people had done that before that book. It's now kind of commonplace for writers, both adult and kids fiction to, to you know, to go on about the tastes of food and how delicious and uh -huh. mouth-watering things are. I think he was one of the first to really articulate that in a kind of visceral way. Um, I think it has that element of a morality tale that is very, uh, that's very attractive to kids and is a little bit scary and dangerous to mm -hmm. adult, pu adult publishers working in juvenile fiction. They go like, who is this a bit dark and a bit, you know, dangerous and so that they, sh they shy away from it. He, he absolutely embraced that because he, he knew he had a gift or he believed he had a gift for comedy and darkness together. Um, and I think perhaps it, another ingredient is that, that so from almost any other character you can think of, you know, this strange adult who doesn't really inhabit an adult world. He's cut himself off from all other human society. He's built this sort of crazy world, you know, where he just has a factory full of Oompa Loompas doing his, his bidding. And he's, he is almost like, a, like an adult who never ceased being a child. Right. And so I think that he is very mesmeric to a, to a child's mind. And, and that character, um, you, you know, it's kind of, it's different from any other character that Dahl wrote, although there are, there are similarities, but it's the most, he's the most powerful and the most charismatic, I think. You know, what's amazing about that is um, he, he's, he's an adult that refused to give up on that childhood magic. He, he wanted to preserve it and it almost grinds him to a nub. You know, it, it's, it's almost like he, it's just like what we were saying before about um, losing that armor. Once you have those negative experiences, you, you get a little more hesitant. You're a little more um, uh, cautious about the world. And in, in the book, um, he, he definitely seems like the world has let him down. Is The world is not letting him keep this magic. He has to shut himself off. Uh, you know, like... I, I guess if you wanted to make a Christian um, reading of it, it would be <clears throat> uh, God is disappointed and he shut the gates of heaven and then he needed a sacrifice, uh, somebody to prove the humanity is worthy to open those gates again. If you wanted to do that, that just popped into yeah. my head. I didn't mean that, <laughs> but, but it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, so I was wondering as I was reading it, who do you think Rold was? Was he Willy Wonka or was he Charlie? Well, I think he was a bit of both. Um, I think, as you were just saying, he definitely was uh, an, a huge, a gigantic adult who had kept the eye of a child and the sensibility of a child um, in a way that w was more extreme and exaggerated uh, and true than anyone else I've ever met. Um, but I think he was, so in that sense, he was Charlie, but in the sense that you, again, you were alluding to that Wonka is, is also a child. I think yeah. there was quite a lot of him that was in, that he put into Willy Wonka. I mean, he liked the idea of inventing things himself. He liked mm -hmm. the, this idea of being uh, a giver of gifts, a, a, a distributor of munificence, uh, quick to judge other people if they didn't, he felt they didn't live up to those standards. Yeah. Um, I think he was definitely a bit of a, a bit of Wonka in that way too, but probably you know Wonka as well in that that sense of he liked the feeling of empowering other people. Um, you know, as I said, I speak of, I can speak of that personally. That you know, once he once I got over the oh they've sent a child, 
reaction. You know, it was like, hey, I, I like you and I want to introduce you to people and I want to, you know, help help make your career go. So, you know, he was he was a very Wonka type figure himself like that. Yeah, you know, uh, reading the book, that was the impression I got that here is here is an author really trying to keep that magic alive, trying to instill it in a generation of readers. But then when I was reading um, the biography, I, I was really struck with, you know, I'm, I'm always, this was, this was a, a taboo in my college years, trying to understand the author who wrote the book. I was chastised time and time again. Don't try to understand the author, judge the work on its own merits. But I've always been interested in the environments that shape the lives that write these books. So when I was reading the biography, I couldn't help but think, no, he's Charlie. He's somebody when he was a child who was kind of a pawn, kind of battered about by adults and, and sort of left to the, the left to chance, almost. Not, not necessarily chance, but just sort of a pawn. And like he's yearning for that mentor, yearning for somebody to be who he is now to bring him along. So um, to me, that's that's kind of the read that your biography gave me of that book. Oh, I, 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 I think that's I think that's very fair. I think he I think he felt children had generally I mean, not just for himself. I think he felt children did lacked a voice in the world, you know, that they were always being told what to do, never given or often not, not given proper explanations, that they were very, they could be very critical and aware um, being, well, they hypocritical, but, yeah. you know, um, flexible in the way they applied one rule for, to their kids and, and another one to themselves. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, and he was also aware of little things like the fact that, you know, when you're a small child, you can't see up and see what's on the shelf. And there are things always that you can't see or can't quite get to and you're not allowed to get to. And I mean, those are all small things. But he, he, he was he was kind of vividly aware, aware of them and very secure of his own judgment. There. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. The other thing you say about not he would have agreed with you about. Uh, about not connecting the author with, with with his work, he was he was very uncomfortable about that about doing that. You know, when I spoke to him about that, he was like, "Oh no, no, I've got nothing to do with that. It's all come, it all comes out of my head." You know, and and he also was very strong on. I mean, he'd met a few famous writers in his time, including his hero Hemingway. He said he was one of his favorite things. He said, "Like, don't meet your heroes. They never they never live up to your expectations." Um, so, you know, it was like, you know, the, the, an artist makes his work, his, his, his or her work, judge them on that. Don't, don't judge them on their lives. Yeah, I would expect an author to say that. I really do. Um, because, you know, as a, as a reader, as somebody who always preferred that for, uh, for, for my entertainment, it is a direct line into an author's brain, whether they want you there or not. You are, you're getting their patterns, you're getting their their sense of, of how they're moving around. And, and I think there was something in the biography where you, you pointed something out to him and then he had to fact check himself. Uh, what was that? He, he felt, um, you pointed out, well, was it because of this in your life that you wrote this? Yeah. Yeah. I pointed out to him something that seemed really obvious to me. And I think it is pretty obvious that most of the young heroes or heroines of his stories are, have either, they are either orphans or they have lost at least one parent, and they're 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 pulled out of what you call a normal family context. Um, and I'm I made that connection to his, uh, you know, a he I made that connection to his own life because he lost his father when he was young, but right. but he he was he he denied that the the heroes and heroines of his stories were actually orphans or deracinated until I started churning off a list of them of them too. <laughs> oh oh yeah you've rather caught me out there you know i didn't yeah. i didn't expect that uh, i had never really thought about that and he was you know i mean he was very av averse to being to you know any kind of psychological analysis of himself and how that that uh, affected his writing yeah i i mean that is that is something that 
I felt when I was reading it, like this is a person processing childhood trauma. And it, it's, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, the, the Wonka figure is the mentor or the father figure or somebody who, who, a male individual who's going to show him the world and lay it all out there. And then he didn't have to assemble it himself, basically. It was prepackaged. Um, you know, losing his father at such a young age and then uh, losing their status too. He didn't realize that, but they, you know, there was a, a, a dip in status for the family as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they had a, to, to relocate. So he was never Charlie poor, but uh, he did experience some levels. Yeah. And I think he had a, nat I mean, he had a very strong natural tendency towards, you know, backing the underdog and, 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 yeah, I would, say, I would say that's a very that was a strong part of his personality. Whether it came from his own experience, I don't know. I think it probably did. I think it probably came less from the loss of his father because he had an amazing mother yeah. who sort of uh, became both mother and father together. And, and he, I mean, he said several times to me, you know, I did not suffer as a child from not having wow. a father. You know, um, but I think what he did suffer from was boarding school, you know, being pulled out of a loving family environment and put into a, a, a thoroughly hostile one where, you know, love and affection was absent, where, you know, irrational punishments were meted out to boys by older boys, you know, and that included mm -hmm. beatings and floggings. And, and really it was, you know, I mean, he, he, he was a British, private schools were rough places and yeah. you know you had to you had to be quite tough to survive them and I think you know I think that they left their scars on a lot of people and and those yeah. particular scars I think um you know I, I mean it helped mark him and they said I think there's there's likely to be a connection between that and and the a, a lot of the subject material in his books and in his semi but I don't know if it's no, it's not of course in in, in, in your edition. But he he wrote this semi autobiographical book called Boy, um, which is really a series of vignettes. But you know that that is pretty tough uh, condemnation of his time as a, a, a as a boy at a boarding school. And the early drafts of that were even tougher. You know, he, he, it suggests that he actually thought of committing suicide while he was, there, was a teenager. Wow. So. Um, uh, I think I think that's not to be underestimated. What yeah. A, what what an formative effect that had. Yeah, and those those scars last a long time, which is why I find it surprising that in 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 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, he seems to be bemoaning the loss of traditional values and um, and this this loss of structure and discipline with. The children nowadays watching their TV, eating their bubble gum, their chewing gum all day, and then demanding things and things and things. Um, it's so funny because he had all that. And then he was the troubled, I mean, he not the troubled child, but he, he was the one who acted out, you know, he, with the great mouse plot, <laughs> with, with uh, the jar of uh, jawbreakers or, or whatever. So it, it, that some of these things are just such contradictions and it, it's either a brain trying to work out the trauma and justify it, or I, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not a psychologist, so uh, that's unfair, but, but it is interesting. He's bemoaning the loss of values and tradition. And yet he had what you would consider extreme structure. Yeah. It's an interesting one. I, I mean, yeah, I think it's an interesting conundrum. Um, but I think I think it is sort of connected in that in that I think he felt that there was, you know, he'd also been through the war. He'd mm -hmm. seen, you know, I mean, although he was in the States for 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 much of it, his own family, he'd seen, he then came back and saw his own family, you know, with ra ration food rationing went on in the UK into the 1950s. In fact, it got worse at the end of the war. Um, so I think he had a strong you know, people had just like a tiny pat of butter per person per week, you know, um, one little, you know, few ounces of meat every week. So there was a real, there was a real sense of 
what it's like to be denied things and also where, where there was a culture of excess. And um, I mean, one of the things that I remember about him as a person was that he was very into what he called treat. You know, he, he, he thought lovely things were a very good thing, but they, they shouldn't become, you know, the expect a day-to-day -day expectation. You know, a lovely meal, a bar of chocolate or whatever needs to be a, tr a treat, you know, a reward for hard work or, or, or a reward for, it doesn't have to be a reward for anything. It just, it, it, it shouldn't be taken for granted. It should be enjoyed, celebrated, um, you, you know, uh, it was a treat, you know. Savored. Got... Yeah, I, I savored. So yes. uh, something, something like that needs to be, uh, you need to take your time instead of just cram it down and then look for the next one. So how would he feel today if he knew this Sun Tup edition was was coming out of his this extravagant wonderful edition would he would he approve would he see value in it or would he say oh that's just more fuss than uh the stories like how would he react um honestly i think he'd be very flattered that mm -hmm. that that somebody had taken the trouble or some people had taken the trouble to do this um i i i think he would always want that to be the the cheap, the three, the three buck seventy-five copies out there, so that any, you know, any, so that his stories were accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's interesting that you know, when he was alive, he, you know, even when he died, children's fiction was very much the country cousin, or the, you know, it was very much the second division, second league to adult fiction. Right. Um, and I think without realizing it, and, and he was a great, you know, he was always blowing the trumpet of, of, of kids fiction um, at a time when not very many other people did. And I think he would have really enjoyed what's happened in the 30 years since he died. You know, the whole Harry Potter phenomenon in a wow. way, you know, the, the barriers between children's literature and adult literature have sort of broke, been broken down and certainly children's literature is way more respectable and, and uh, you know, celebrated and uh, admired than it was in his own day. And I think he'd be, I think he'd be shocked that he'd have been shocked if you'd gone back to 1990 and said to him, you know, somebody's going to make this deluxe edition and go through all your early drafts and show the, you know, lost chapters of this and blah, blah, blah. I think, I think he'd be, I think he'd be very, flattered i think he'd be proud for himself but also probably proud for the art of writing for children so do, did he realize the impact his book had on on the world i mean i, I assumed he did <clears throat> i think he did yeah i mean yeah. you know he had you know he he had tons and tons of mail from you know yeah. from children you know like i don't know how many letters a week but it was probably thousands you know and from kids all over the world and you know he in the early days he he tried to respond to all of them himself and then he had various you know uh mm. kind of pro forma responses that he would send but he still if somebody sent him and a child sent him an interesting letter they would likely get uh you know his secretary was told to pull out the interesting ones not the ones you know because you know he was a bit annoyed where the class teacher would get like to oh. students in the class to right. you know to write to write a letter you know and it's like well what am i supposed to do you know write but spend my time re responding to these but if a if a kid you know drew a dream for him um you know and sent and sent a picture of the dream and said you know i think this is a dream that the one of his characters the big friendly giant might have dreamed up you know he he they're, they'd like them in that case she did get a, a very delightful personal response but you know he's, he would sometimes write little poems and verse if a if a child's letter really touched him that's really that's great so how was he as a dad to to his own children um oh, so i'm not really the right person to ask oh that's that person, fine but I mean, it seemed to me seemed to me you know to be uh he was an amazing dad i think i think his kids would all agree with what I'm saying to you, that he was an amazing dad 
until you hit puberty. And then, <laughs> and then he wasn't so interested. So he, I he, think, you know, I think it's that his identify and self-identification with the child was up to, we're basically up to puberty, I think, where, for want of a better word, there was a kind of innocent view of the world. I think he, he didn't have too much time for the self-obsession and, and narcissism or, or all those kind of things that, that tend to come piling into the teenage kid, you know. Um, so you were a child and then you were a traitor. <laughs> and then yeah, you probably. walked away from that. So that's it. And all that, I keep thinking of the story of when you went to the house and he said they sent a child. Shouldn't That should have charged him. That should have made him feel somebody I can connect with. I'd like to think it did in the end, but yeah. probably, but probably going back to what I said about the status of children's literature, he he probably thought, ah, the BBC, they're finally going to make a film about me, uh, and they'll send someone quite grand and distinguished, and yeah. you know, to do the interview. And it's like, oh, they sent the office boy or the you know sure. the guy who delivers the coffee or something, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could see so that. I think, I think that probably informed the very first reaction, but certainly, right. certainly right. after that, I think it was an asset to be young. So, what would he oh. think today of the social media culture? <laughs> I mean, I, when I was reading the book, I thought, "Wow, we can update Charlie and the Chocolate Factory um, with with a few things." So, TV and screen time, of course, would be so. Uh, the, and you mentioned about the narcissism and the, the sort of chaos of those teen years. What would he think? Like, is it a mercy that he's no longer here? Yeah, breaking up. Uh, yeah. No, I, I was just saying that I think uh, I think he'd hate all the social media culture. I mean, from, from his dislike of television, you only need to extrapolate it, see how how innocent TV, 1960s TV, right. <laughs> to, to what we have today, to, to think that he'd, he, he'd be horrified, I think. I think he's, you know, he really believed in books and in reading and in that, that thing of, you know, uh, I mean, you know, the, the book stimulating the internal imagination of the young reader. And he, he, you know, he was a big believer that actually when you're ill or in trouble or depressed, a book can be, you know, this alternative world of a book can be a real salvation to you. And I, I think he he was always suspicious of something that that came a little bit too easily, you know, like movies or TV or something where you had less imagining to do in order to to, to enjoy it. Yeah, because the social media things uh, violate two of his commandments. <laughs> uh, which would be, you know, screen time and being lost in this sort of thing that's just hand fed you. This ideas are doled out to you and there's only one way to ingest them. And then the other thing is uh, instant gratification. Um, social media, it, it, is, it is one treat after a next, after a next, and everybody's on their phone hitting for that next pellet. You know, they're like little rats in that experiment, just trying to get that instant gratification. Um, so... So that's interesting that I, I mean, that's one thing I was struck with. I'm like, oh, you had no idea how it, bad it was going to get. You're spot on there. And, and, and with Amazon drones delivering things, you know, like you don't even have to wait for anything anymore. He was going to send the chocolate through the TV, which is funny because that's like sleeping with the enemy, right? I mean, it's like, there's the, he's going to turn this into a vehicle for wonder if he's, if that's the last thing he does. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's so much with, with the biography and, and, and with, the, with the story, there's just this struggle. I found it really interesting that he was loose with his facts and his own autobiography, but he was just so particular with the way he thought how things should be. You know, it, it's almost like he was, had a little, well, there's a little example of hypocrisy, right? Did, was he a particular man? Did he have to have things a certain way? Uh, yes, in certain, yes and no. I mean, I think uh, that wasn't true uh, 
around the house. Okay. But when it came to his, he had a, a, a little hut at the bottom of his garden where he did most of his writing. And, um, you know, in that hut, which was like his own kind of private little world, everything, what it was very particular. And it, a lot of it was very eccentric. You know, he had a chair with a hole cut, a, a big old armchair, which is something his mother had. And he had a hole cut out of the back so that, so that there was no pressure on his back. And he had these Heath Robinson apparatuses to, to direct heat onto his hands when it was cold. And he was surrounded by all these funny little objects, you know, from, from his past life and his childhood. And he had to have, he, he wrote on a, a board that he designed himself with only on very particular lined yellow legal paper, which he had sent over from the US to the UK. And he had to have his pencils of a certain type all sharpened and there could only be an even number of, of pencils in the little pencil holder. And they all had to be sharpened before he began writing. So it was, uh, um, so in that sense, he was very particular, but only in that, that small area of, uh, you know, of his work, I think. So, yeah, you, the way you describe it in, in your book, um, I was expecting something much more magical, something, you know, like, like uh, almost like uh, lost in the hundred acre wood type feel to it, but it was it felt like a boy's treehouse. Like, you know, it's it's just this chaos, uh, and it, it's it's it, it was interesting. I wasn't expecting to feel that way. No, it's very much like a boy's treehouse, but a sort of slightly grown up version, but pretty much the same. You know, and and he was very proud of the fact that. No one ever cleaned it. No one swept the floor. So he, it was, there was cigarettes everywhere. He was, and all the shavings from his, his you know, from his pencil sharpness were on the floor. And it, it was, <laughs> it, you know, it was, it was pretty filthy. And um, he was proud of it. <laughs> yeah. Which he wouldn't no, have I, been proud of in the past. Um, right, right. So that, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's almost, he's proud of the preservation of this, anarchist uh, boyhood. Um, I think we're going to be running out of time in just a few minutes, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, on this book. Like, how, how, what do you feel personally being involved with this and, um, and, and seeing the, the book? Uh, well, it's been, a, it's been a lovely experience. It's very nice to sort of try and focus one's thoughts about a writer that I know a lot about onto one book and, you know, with a short series of, uh, you, you know, in a very short space, try and make that one book tell, tell a story of, uh, you know, or a little, give you a little window into uh, both the book and the, the way it was written and in, and on to the writer's life. So in that sense, it was a very, uh, it was a very enjoyable experience. It was nice to, you know, I didn't do all the uh, archive research, but I had, a, you know, I was involved in a little bit of it. And uh, it was nice reminding myself of what the, the detail of all that work that went in to writing this book, which as you, you just showed when you waved it around is, you know, it's a very slender children's book, you know, mm -hmm. with short chapters and you'd think it wouldn't have taken as long to write as it did. And, and I think it, it, was, it was good you know, it's good for any writer, biographer, non-fiction writer, whatever, to be reminded that, that people take, to, take a long time sometimes to write something that's good and really successful. Well, it's powerful. I mean, it really is. You know, uh, I think I could see how a child would re react to um, <clears throat> hearing the story, but I, the layers and layers there for an adult to unpack are, are remarkable. And I would recommend anybody who gets that book to get this book as well it is it is really fascinating you know I I do I feel like Charlie I wish I wish I had mentors like this where to be surrounded and with with these with these people and to be influenced by their lives um you know magic is contagious and I think uh, infectious and I think it ups everybody's sort of expectations of the world and and themselves and their abilities and so um i appreciate you taking the time today and i appreciate your involvement you've been absolutely charming and great and i i'm i'm 
I'm thrilled for the chance to just get to talk to you. Um, so you're, you're, uh, I, I know the fans will love this and, and it's really above and beyond. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's been a great pleasure. It's been, you've been a, a lovely person to chat to. Well, enjoy the rest of your holiday. And, um, I will do. and if you can, uh, I know the time difference is something of a bear, but try to get to the page, the fans of Santa page or somehow to see how the fans react. It's always, I think for the people who contribute, um, I, I always think of, of you folks, um, and, and how you would like to see, cause they go crazy. They, they love this stuff. And, um, I think you should hear it all. So again, thank definitely you. Check it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And good and luck. luck. All right. Thanks. <laughs> all okay, the best. Jeff. Bye. Bye.